one in the town that must never be closed down. It's the one the city listens to each day. And it's run by Frawley John, he's the one they call the man. If you tune in short his soon, you'll hear him say. Now you'd better get up soon, don't just lie up there till noon. The morning's gone and you've the child to wash. Sure, John needs nerves of steel, trying to keep an even keel. As he gives his favorite what's another lash. So as out of bed you hop, you will hear snap cracky pop. As Frawley gets the morning underway. And first the roll he call of the misses big and small. And then at nine o'clock you'll hear him say, Come on Crystal off to school or you'll grow to be a fool. It's time you ran along down River Road. Then he reads the latest news and the editorial views and gives the sport results of every code. Now his forecast is a howl of the weather fair or foul. He has a name for every sort of climb. Dear Sam and Gussie Gale, Billy Breeze and Harry Hale, sure Ronnie Rain is with us all the time. Now if your heart should stray, or your pigeons lose their way, or if you lose your only front door key, sure in the last and found, to find it you'll be bound. The best listeners in Europe, you'll agree. And as the morning wears on, there is no stopping John. As the dressing gown regret, he tries to rise. Get up, you lazy lot, for I know you're in the cast. You know the sparrow never tells me lies. Well, I could go on for days about John Frawley and his ways. His radio that helps us carry on. He's a part of Limerick life in the smooth and in the strife. Francis Lawrence, Mary, Peter, Frawley, John. When Radio Limney brought its last broadcast to an end and signed off for the last time at Christmas 1988, there were not a few of its listeners who felt that it wasn't just the end of a pirate station, but the end of real local broadcasting in Limerick. Certainly, it was the end of an era. Happily, many of those listeners changed their minds with the advent of Order Law, but for a dedicated few, and perhaps more than a few, no station, however good or professional its output, could take the place of Radio Limney in their affections. For Radio Limney, like its owner John Frawley, was very much of the people and for the people. It was special in a way that no other station could imitate, just as John Frawley had a broadcasting style that was inimitable, although many have tried then and since to imitate it. Nor could anyone analyse John Frawley's style of broadcasting and say what it was that made him a household name, and not just in Limerick. Certainly it was folksy, but it was a long way removed from being amateurish. There was no obvious polish to the performance, but any professional would have envied its seamless quality. John Frawley tapped that rich vein of iconoclasm that runs through the Irish character, it certainly runs through the Limerick character, and presented us to ourselves in a way that hadn't been done before. Occasionally it brought down on him the ire of the begrudgers. We're not short of begrudgers in Limerick, in all walks of life. But from those who really mattered, his listeners, it brought affection and respect. The song we opened with was one token of that respect and affection, written by Councillor Joe Harrington and sung by Joe's wife, Martha. And tonight we're going to talk to some of the others who held John in respect and affection. And the begrudgers, well, they can do what Brendan Behan recommended begrudgers to do. First, John, another John, John, Dr. John Maloney, who knew John Frawley back in the days when he started his broadcasting career with Radio Limerick Weekly Echo, as it was called. How did you get to know John Frawley? Well, John, uh, uh, Jim, good evening. I I remember, uh, I think it was 78, would have been 78, there was an ad in the paper, Limerick Echo appeared, disc jockeys wanted for radio. 
So naturally I was enthusiastic and I applied and uh, I got a letter back, all excited, uh, son J John Farley, to meet him at two o'clock on one s Tuesday afternoon. I think it was either the 9th of June or the 9th of July. So off I went, put on my best suit, shirt and tie, comb my hair. Actually, I got a haircut that morning and down... And I was standing outside the, the uh, Radio Limerick, or not Radio Limerick, but uh, the Weekly Weekly Echo. Echo offices at the time, sitting on the steps. And there was a chap sitting on the, you know, the little lip under the window. Baldy looking chap, actually, at the time. And he walked over and said, are you John Maloney? He said, yes. He said, I'm John Frawley. So we held our interview on the ledge. And he said, look, come down on Monday morning and we'll start. So from that day, off we went. And some of the memories and the, the things we have uh, go What away. was the station like when you when you went into the, the weekly echo? John was station manager at that time, was he not? He was, yeah, he was station The station resembles really what we have here today, almost to, it worked professionally. Everybody got behind it and everybody knew what they had to do and it worked. Um, it was on the, in the basements of uh, the Limerick Weekly Echo offices and a uh, small little room and two little decks, one tape recorder, and that's the way it worked. But John had an air, he had something behind him that drove everybody. I mean, you went, you knew what you had to do and you just went and did it. Of course, to a certain extent, that would have come from John's uh, days in the show bands, when in fact you had to do uh, an awful lot of organising to keep a show band on the road and make sure that it, it was able to perform professionally. And he would have brought this experience into his work in, in the radio station at RLWE. Um, did he do any broadcasting himself at that time? Oh, he did. He, he started immediately on the breakfast show. When RLWE started, he was on the breakfast show. And uh, he stayed around for the rest of the day. I remember when I first went in there, the first couple of days, he used to come in and stay around with you without keeping an eye on you, without, he, without you knowing that he was actually watching you. But he was always there smiling and he was always there to give a word of, well, look, it didn't work today, but don't worry about it. Think about it and we'll do it tomorrow. You know, he, he was calm and he was pleasant and he helped you. You know, in the early days, he, he was there, you could turn to him and ask him a question. And even if you got, I mean, five times he sacked me from that station. <laughs> we had a thing running, every couple of months he'd walk up and say, John, good luck. And I'd say, right, John. And about three or four weeks later, a couple of months later, I'd meet him downtown. And he said, well, John, how's it going? I said, not too bad. When are you coming back? I said, you sacked me. Ah, that's forgotten about. It's time to come back again. <laughs> we, they were great days. I mean, what can you say about John? He, he gave me the start. I'll always remember that from, I mean, nobody else wanted me. Uh, the powers that be in Dublin wouldn't even listen to me. But John gave me the start, and I owe him. For what I have today, I owe to him. Casting your mind back to that time, John Maloney, um, John Frawley developed, perhaps he always had his own particular style of broadcasting. Um, was it evident in those days in RLWE that he, he was in touch with the people he was broadcasting to in a way that a great many other broadcasters are not? From day one, John had it. John had, because he worried about the little guy in the street or the, the old person at home. He didn't, John didn't want to be a star. Uh, he didn't want to be a megastar, a huge personality. It's people made John the star that he eventually turned out to be. He just spoke to people that he felt were on their own at home. That's what he always said to me. Well, what he used to say to us, Don and Radio Limney, and RLW in particular, was that um, when you're talking to the people, talk on a one-to-one -one basis. Not that you're a big megastar behind a microphone, but think of the person that's on their own, maybe, and just has the radio. Uh, and needs the voice on the radio to just to keep in touch with what's happening. So he knew that from day one, and people eventually made him a star. He didn't want to be one. He, I remember once he told me, I don't want to be a star, because I said to him, what's it like being a big megastar? Because he got all the mail. We got nothing. I mean, if we got one card in a couple of months, we were excited with it. But I remember saying to him one day, what's it like being a megastar? He said, I don't want to be one. I hope and I just don't want to be a megastar people keep writing to me. He actually used to ask people not to write and don't send things to him, but he turned out to be a star. Mm. Mike Hogan, you worked with um, John Frawley on Radio Limney after he had uh, left RLWE to set up his own station. Well, actually, I worked in RLWE in, from October till uh, 
um, January 8th, wasn't it? January 8th. Or 5th, 5th, actually, because my, my spare time, I guess I remember it. And uh, I first met uh, John, <coughs> pardon me. I had uh, gone back to get some records, which I'd left overnight, because I used to do a Sunday night programme. We used to reopen at 11 o'clock at night and go until 1.00. And it was the most unusual program because it was sponsored by uh, two well-known pubs in the city. And the pubs used to close at 11 o'clock at night. And here we were doing this pretty good thing. And I went in one morning to collect my records. And John was sitting down. But I had known John with um, uh, topping, if you know what I mean. And the, 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 the wig actually was alongside him, in, alongside the turntables. And the uh, RLWE closed down as I said, in, in that particular uh, 1979, 5th of January. And it was in April of 1979, I found out that there was a new station opened up in Cecil Street. So, of course, being very much involved and enthusiastic about joining radio again, I um, contacted him by letter. I think that was in April, and I think he contacted me around uh, late August. And um, I started on the 5th of uh, September. 1979 and it was with him I think except for one particular break from 79 until uh, 1988 August 88 and uh, I think that he gave me a great opportunity over the 10 years to present the type of programs I enjoy and indeed which a multitude of people out there enjoy and a variation of programs that uh, I didn't think at the time we were getting on the national network and he was he left me do basically what I want to. I mean, you didn't go overboard with him uh, as regards um, insulting anyone. And as long as you did a good program and you had the listeners out there, he was quite satisfied. He would tell you now and again um, in a certain way that uh, we don't want that. And, uh, but otherwise, uh, John was saying there about, uh, John Maloney was saying there about um, Megastar. John Farley never wanted that. He was a very introverted person. Uh, he was very shy it's amazing to think of it, but he was very shy. If you went to parties or any of the uh, functions which we had in the Glenport, he, he wanted to go into a corner, you know? Whereas uh, being a Scorpio like myself, you would have thought otherwise. Mm. As a matter of fact, we share the same birthday. Uh, he's the 14th November and I am. And, of course, he was a few years older than me. But um, he, he gave Limerick, I think, and not alone Limerick, he gave as far as Ballyhall as we used to be received him. And as far as Clonmel, Waterford, John the Man, and that's what he's known as affectionately, uh, the, how he got the name was uh, through a record which was uh, featured in the film Greece. And it was John Travolta and, of course, uh, Olivia Newton-John. And he um, uh, emphasised, of course, to the people on air that uh, John Travolta was the fella and Olivia Newton-John was the girl. And I'm John the Man. And that's actually how it happened. <laughs> Amazing, but true. They are. One of the things, uh, I, I suppose, that, that always happens when people who worked on, on the old stations get together, they, they reminisce about some of the peculiar things that happened. Um, do you have any memories of, of, of <clears throat> some of the vicissitudes that you suffered under in, in working uh, in, yeah. in some of the uh, older stations? There, 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 I think that uh, it, it's something that should be done. I, I don't know if I have the qualifications to do it, but maybe somebody might help me. We get a ghostwriter for Baron de Pond uh, to write about uh, local radio in uh, Limerick, uh, illegal or community, whatever you want to call it. And uh, there was one particular uh, morning, and I used to do a program called Anything Goes, which is an oral kaleidoscope of fun facts and figures. It was just a gay burden type program, but anyway, um, there was flooding in the docks. And as you know, we were down in Lower Cecil Street at the time. And somebody told me, I think it was, uh, there was a shop there in the Spades, um, I can't think of the name, a Jack Frost, I think his name was, oh, right. am I right? And he said, uh, John is flooded below. And I said, we were up three stories, I think, or two and a half stories anyway. It was the building, by the way, but the only pregnant wall in Limerick at the time. But anyway, <laughs> and I was coming around by the bed for row, uh, just down from the Carlton there, and the gentleman pulled up in the car. Uh, he left down the window, and he handed me a pair of waders. And he says, John said you might need them. So I battled my way through the water in uh, to the building and up the steps. And the next thing you could hear John saying up, it's all right, Mike Hogan's coming. I hope he has the boots I was asking for on the radio. So that was the contact between uh, Radio Lumley and the people of Limerick. It was quite amazing. It was, it was uncanny. 
Because all you had to say, in some occasions, there's a car missing, has anybody seen it? And you didn't even have to ask if there was a car missing. If there was a car which was there for less, for, sorry, for more than the appointed time, somebody would ring up and it said, and the next thing the person that owned the car would ring in. As a guy's lost property, uh, things like budgies used to often be brought in to me in the early hours, and I used to do the early morning broadcasts, because the door uh, used to be left open because there was a butcher underneath, and he used to, all butchers do start early in the morning. So the result was another day, uh, a young fella carried a goat in, and he said, I found that. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, was, it was amazing, you know. Almost I think a, so. a, a, a menagerie. Yes, indeed. Now, for those who didn't have the pleasure of hearing John uh, in his heyday on the, the radio, um, we have a little piece of tape. And uh, it isn't just John. There's also another man who was a, a famous broadcaster on Radio Limney, Walter Stanley. And uh, another voice who is still with us um, very much. In fact, I see the face staring at me here through the studio window, and I leave you to figure out who that is yourselves. I was born 43 years ago. <laughs> I'm 10 years younger than Walter O'Rourke Stanley. <laughs> and we discussed breastfeeding and bottles this afternoon. But I can tell you, I was born and reared on Danaher Sheehan, Morty King, Ter Casey and Charlie St. George. So I unfortunately have to state categorically, as my colleague here on my right would say, that on Saturday I will be cheering as loudly as I can for young Munster. But I'm not leaving you away that likely, John. What's the Shannon connection, though? My father and my son will be out there, please God cheering themselves horse for Shannon because my father is Johnny Frawley a sandman right from the old island road and a breadman for 43 years the same age as I am now <laughs> <laughs> what's all this about age anyway <laughs> well, you brought it up John <laughs> I've said enough no no I'm not letting you go yet this, this, uh, what's this about the tope you were talking to Walter there this afternoon there is no truth whatsoever in the rumour that I have a bet my hairpiece against a certain Shannon supporter's hairpiece on Saturday. <laughs> no truth whatsoever. My hairpiece was thrown up into the stand when Munsters won the cup in 1980, and I haven't seen it since. So I couldn't. <laughs> so, so I couldn't even wager it if I wanted to. Thank you, Leonard. Okay, John. Now moving along to Walter O'Rourke Stanley, who's uh, Breffney O'Rourke. Referee O'Rourke Stanley. Uh, Walter, I know you're a bit camera shy and Mike shy, but I, I, I believe, I believe, Walter, you had a part tonight in, you had a part tonight in this, in, in Sheemsa. Beautiful. Correct, sir. And you got seven encores. Correct, sir. And there again, the problem was, could I make it up to this lovely premises, Blank Cost Tenors? And I must say, I'm sincerely enjoying myself here. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be on your show tonight, Mr. Uh, Deneen. But first and foremost, may I say, on behalf of Sean and Far, you made a faux pas once more, sir, and we must have it out here now. You said the unfortunate thing is, I have to admit that I'll be supporting young monsters. There again, sir, you did make a complete fox of it. Now, I would be wondering who was drinking you or I. But, gentlemen, this, I wish to say this sincerely, that I know Saturday's match will be a great match. I know, as Mr. Deneen has quite rightly pointed out, that the two best clubs at the moment where supporters are concerned are Young Monsters and Shannon Rugby Football Club. <laughs> also Stanley there, sadly no longer with us. Uh, and before that, um, Len Deneen, and before that again, John Frawley himself. For those of you who might not have um, heard his voice and listened to his inimitable style, I don't know if Lord Reith would have approved, but um, certainly the listeners in Limerick approved in their thousands uh, when Walter and John and several others were on the radio. And I have several of those others here with me in the studio at the moment. Uh, in fact, um, four of the members of the RLO sports team who prior to joining us, were in fact the Radio Limney sports team. Um, on my left, and reading round the table, 
uh, which sounds a bit like the TV commentator who once said uh, of a Norwich football game that for those who were watching in black and white, Norwich were playing in yellow. But um, here on my left is Len Deneen, then Sean Murphy, <laughs> Leonard Burke and Tony McMahon. And uh, in the Legion of the Rear Guard here, Tom O'Donnell, who's going to say a few words as well. Gentlemen, you're obviously you all have fond memories of Radio Limney and of John the Man Frawley. Could I start with you, Tony McMahon? What, what's your most abiding memory of John and uh, Radio Limney? Well, it's a very simple one, Jim. Um, John had uh, an ability to create illusion, um, which, of course, radio is all about. And uh, I remember going in there one afternoon at lunchtime to leave in a tape that was to be played on our uh, tea time programme and uh, whoever, somebody hadn't turned up, turned up. I think it was possibly Alf de Lacey. Alf, if you're out there listening, I think it was you. Um, somebody hadn't turned up. So John had been there since half seven in the morning uh, to half one. And as I went in, he was playing a record. And uh, when the record finished, John said, I'm here since half seven this morning. I haven't had a cup of tea, a sandwich. There's a hole in my sock. What are my shoes isn't fitting me? What am I going to do? So he put on another record and we chatted away. And in the next 15 minutes, John Frawley got enough food brought around. This was the time when we had a little shed next to the city theatre. And in, in that half an hour, John Frawley got enough food brought around him to feed a nation. Because ladies ran around with uh, plates of soup, uh, heaps of sandwiches, uh, leftovers from the Sunday dinner. It was a Monday, uh, and and the whole lot. So he he had he had uh, uh, number one, the ability to create that illusion, and number two, he had a unique limerickness, if I might coin that phrase. He knew what turned limerick people on. He knew the way they felt, and he knew how to get to them. And uh, he invented. We are left with a whole list of. Uh, John Frawley sayings that will always be his, such as the Mises in the morning, uh, the DGBs. Um, he had many, many more. His little trick of giving names to the different types of weather you could get, which uh, was in Joe Harrington's song earlier on, uh, about talking about Ronnie Rain and, 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 and Billy Breeze, Billy Breeze and, and, and so on. Mm. He, um, you, you mentioned he tapped this, this, this strain of, of limericness and that he had a way of, uh, as you said, creating illusion that, that people would bring him around food if he said he was hungry. Was there a sense, Lendonine, in which um, women, all the women in particular, um, developed a kind of a motherly interest in, in John Frawley? Did he create that kind of illusion that he, he was the, the, the sort of the long lost son that they all wanted to, 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 to mother and look after? He did really, Jim. Um, he had, as Tony said, that uniqueness about it. Um, John Frawley was, you know, he epitomised really the Limerick man. Uh, the Limerick man uh, who thought deeply about Limerick City. Uh, I mean, words like, stay away from that sugar, you won't have a tooth in your head left. Uh, that People, all women and uh, old men and that, thought that they were, he was actually talking to them, you know. He brought in Tom Clifford, who was, I suppose, uh, Again, another character who was a legend in his own lifetime. And he would say to Tom when he, at quarter past nine, when he'd say, get up the G DGBs, you know, that's the dressing ground brigade, as Tony said. Stay in bed, Clifford. Virginia, who's Tom's wife, bring him up a cup of tea, you know. And that was, okay, some people would laugh at it and scoff at it as they scoffed at his death notices. But really, when it went on the line, there was a lot behind that. And uh, that really epitomizes the man. Tony. Well he did that he did that in apparently a very off the cuff kind of fashion. But as we all know, uh, John had uh, he had a very good filing system. Uh, the Mises, for example, were all filed under uh, under their A to Z and their ages and, and the whole lot. And he went through them every morning and rigorously, religiously he called out the people whose birthdays it were it it, it was. Uh, and, and as well as that, he also had a list of people who lived alone and he made certain during his programme to mention each one of them. 
and thus brought a very personal uh, approach to, to radio. I, I think, Jim, that uh, what Len talked there about the way he used to uh, speak to old people and give them confidence, I think I can really uh, relive with that because my father, the Lord of died under the impression that the people on television could actually speak to him and that he could speak back to them because I often went out and he'd say something and I said, how did you hear that? Oh, he said, Frank told me. Recalling the way Frank Hall used to point at people in the old uh, Hall's Victorian Weekly. So I can appreciate that that was what, like, get out in the morning and when you have the leg out, you're not so bad. I think that's what kept old people going. It was a way of giving them confidence. A few other things, I suppose, about John Foley that I remember. One of, it, one of them is relates to Alfie de Lacey, and if he's listening tonight, Tony, when Alfie played three in a row on, the, on this famous Monday Night Total, <laughs> that was the cue to drink a half one and two pints and Nicholas's. And if the record got stuck, he was in trouble. He'd have to go and leave yeah. the last pint. <laughs> the other one was how strict we're on time here. And we used to read the racing guys all after the prayers in the, on the evening time. And then there might be traffic. And he'd say, like, here it's spot on there. He'd say, well, I see Sean Murphy now. He's stuck in traffic. He won't be in for about five minutes. I think that were, uh, really... For all his relaxation, I think that's what made him unique, you know. But th this is something that I mentioned earlier on, that um, John had a kind of folksiness about his broadcasting style that you could never actually describe as amateurism. Uh, amateurishness because it, it, he wasn't amateur at all he, he uh, and if he wasn't polished he certainly had a very professional way of doing things but he, he was in touch so much with his audience that he made it seem as if he was just the fellow who'd called in from next door to talk to them D was that the impression he gave you Leonard Buck? Well I think he did his uh, survey as you'd like to call it or MRBI poll or Lansdowne marketing poll by leaving the station at round about 11.30 and making his way downtown for a morning cup of coffee calling into a few uh, debtors or creditors, I don't know which and uh, by the time he returned at lunchtime he had what was happening in Limerick Life for you between lunchtime and 2.30 before you got back into the relaxed afternoon state. He definitely had his uh, finger on the pulse of what was happening in the city at the time. And I think it rarely took him maybe a, a trot to Patsy Flannery's. Uh, Sean Murphy might know more about this. A trot, a trot to Patsy Flannery's down uh, William Street into O'Connell Street and back up to Upper Gerald Griffin Street and in that space of time in two hours he had his finger on the pulse of what was happening in, in Limerick life and uh, he definitely created some memorable illusions and uh, it rubbed off I think on all the sports team because uh, a lot of us were introduced to sport through the late Tommy Hines and uh, Tommy like John Frawley was, uh, both of them would forgive me for saying so, a chancer in, the, in their own right. And they introduced people to, uh, to radio in uh, the most undignified uh, circumstances because they may have asked you a question and as you were about to reply, they departed from the studio, left you on your own for up to five or six minutes. And uh, for some, I think uh, for Lyndon Ian and Tony McMahon in particular, it was a baptism of fire, but that's how it happened. They just left you there. They left you to get on with it. If you were capable, you got on with it. If not, there was silence. There was stunning silence for the rest of the day. But they, they left the studio and left you there. And Tommy Hines carried it on. I can remember meeting Faulkner O'Donovan at a funeral one night and he, he telling me that he was at... Um, he was in the bath listening to a Monday night sports programme when, when Tommy Hines, a la John Frawley again, uh, decided to play a tape of three well-known Newcastle West supporters, Faulkner Donovan, Finbar Dorgan, and the other name escapes me, but they had made their first venture down to Newcastle West to watch a soccer game. And uh, on the way back, Tom Hines interviewed them in a uh, hostelry in Adair, told them that he wasn't going to use it, but the following night put it on and it didn't introduce them, but said there were three lifelong supporters of Newcastle West, and Faulkner said he nearly fell out of the bat with what <laughs> happened on that night. <laughs> Jim, there's one story I'd have to tell you about the dentist, John O'Callaghan. He was the... One night I went in to get heat and he had my mouth freezed, and... Um, he was telling me about John Farley. He had come back the day previously, drenched to the skin, and uh, he had a very important appointment with a girl. He just couldn't leave it down. There he was, and he trying to do this job, and he drenched the skin. And Farley was on, he said, I'm here in the studio, he says, I have came back drenched after lunch, but I took off the pants, he says, there's no above in the heater, and the shoes and socks are the, are the very same. O'Callaghan said, I wish to God I could do it, he says, but he, there he was, and he had to keep looking the professional up, but Farley was doing his job. <laughs> He used to say to himself, hang on till I have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> right. Um, if John Frawley is one of the, the well-known broadcasters in Limerick, there's another man, too, who epitomises uh, entertainment in Limerick, and we're very fortunate indeed uh, that he is one of the founder directors here at RLO, Tom O'Donnell of Tom and Pascal fame. Tom spent most of his broadcasting career on Big L, but did do a stint with John Frawley on Radio Limney. Tom, what would you be your abiding memory of John Frawley? Well, you see, Jim, <coughs> unlike the boys here who work for much longer with him uh, on Radio Limney, I, I go back at a more personal level because I knew John, his, his family, the Frawleys, and my mother and father were very close friends. And in fact, uh, I can say that his mother was a lovely dear lady, Mrs. Frawley, who visited my own invalid mother for years and visit her and I'd bring her and Brendan then would carry her back or whatever uh, that's Mrs. Farley and Mr. Farley but Mrs. Farley was a lovely kindly lady and if John had all these mannerisms and colloquialisms they all came from his mother his father the bread man as he was on Johnny Farley the bread man and his mother then who was as I said they were divided uh, sporting was one parish isn't that so Lynn and the other young monster but I'll tell you so I knew and then of course later on I got to know John very closely through the showman scene because wherever we go around the country, past myself, we'd bump in where the monarchs were playing. And John had a fine, healthy, happy image. Before he went on the air at all, he was a nice, clean-cut young man, very good and good living, and did all the right things, I said. So when he went to the broadcasting later then, he developed o overnight, one might say, from a, a nice, gentle, showman, clean-cut type into a character by adopting the name of... Some would say it was John, the man, after somebody said earlier on, but some would say it was after a very esteemed businessman down here at the market. So there is a difference of opinion there. But I, I found John just asked me on a phone call that uh, Big L had withdrawn from the scene, and he rang me up at 9 o'clock in the morning, which is an awful thing to do, to wake me up at 9 o'clock. <laughs> a dreadful thing. How dare anybody wake me up before... Uh, 12 o'clock. But anyway, he did... Well, the streets have to be well aired before, before Tom O'Donnell comes out. Oh, they do. Well, anyway, but as I get him back to John himself, he, he does, as all the boys here and all the other speakers, Mike Hogan and all the lads here who were on earlier, John did epitomise uh, the Limerick uh, lifestyle and the old, the old people and the young, and the, the young crowd laughed at him, but still they took a message. But, uh, but finally, when he asked me to go with him, when the other people collapsed, my good friend Richardson and company, I did gladly go along because there again I found out there was a ready-made audience and, and, and you mentioned about limericisms. I'm reminded of this now very quickly, uh, very quickly, when I heard Terry Wogan, another limerick man, talking lately with Christy Borg and as Chris left he says, Chris, he says, give the woman in the bed more porter. And that reminded me of this limit of the John, but John Farley was a good soul and a great character and I, and I, I owe a lot to him for taking me in at a time when I needed it on there with my own show. Right, one of the things actually that was that was quite unique about John Frawley's uh, broadcasting station, Radio Libni, was the, 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 the long list of characters that he brought in, and saving your company, gentlemen, mm. um, all of you would be looked upon as being characters in your own right as well. You all bring your own special bloss to the way you broadcast, and John seemed to have a knack of finding people like this. Uh, unhappily, sadly, some of them have, have now gone to their I eternal reward. Um, none, I suppose, was more idiosyncratic in his broadcasting style than the late Larry Foxy O'Brien, as he was known, who s came out, it seemed, with a torrent of words. The ideas seemed to crowd so much into his brain that he, he couldn't find room for them in his speech. Right. Uh, but yet, it was, it was amazing. It was so listenable to him. You, you had a memory of that, Leonard. Um, Mike Hogan is here with us, and Mike would definitely say, a producer's nightmare. Because Larry researched his programme so thoroughly that he arrived on when the sports programme was ending of a Saturday afternoon with a list of maybe 50 records that had to be found. There was no filing system as there, as, as there is in RLO now. But um, he had to find them, and Mike, in fairness to him, found them. But Larry was there. And the thing about it was that maybe 49 of the 50 records he never got around to playing because he was speaking to everyone and anyone that he had met during that week. But he was always there. He always gave an excellent coverage. And the thing was that the Saturday programmes on our on uh, Radio Limney never went according to schedule because the sports programme did start at 10.30, but it may last until a quarter past 20 past one. And thereafter, you had Larry Foxy O'Brien until possibly <coughs> four o'clock, if he could keep going. Sean Murphy. I think his best selection for an introduction to a request for was for a, per a woman or a person who was dying over in the city home. And the record, he says, it's very special for her. It's nearer my God today. 
<laughs> very, very appropriate. Well, but, Jim, another lovely one, and we were talking about the older people there earlier on, but the younger people related to him, apart from the stay away from that sugar, you won't have a tooth in your head left. When he gave a birthday request, um, he would say for a, for a child, say Susan O'Brien, of three years of age, Susan O'Brien, three years of age, and I thought you were only a baby. You know, it was lovely. <laughs> and then, then, up for the boys... Down and down for the girls. Yeah, yeah, that was happy birthday. Yeah, right, well, yeah. just to give you an idea of what Larry Foxy O'Brien's style was like, if you were in the unfortunate position of never ha having had it, I've got a little piece now, courtesy of Tom O'Donnell. I wish you on this um, uh, wet Saturday afternoon to sit back for the next three hours, uh, listen to Lawrence Foxy O'Brien, ex-mayor of Grand Duke Hiking, here at Red Illumini, Uptown, Limerick City. There you are. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have some beautiful tracks lined up for today, and just to let you know, some of the tracks that I have lined up, I haven't many, uh, I haven't uh, very many actually lined up. Now, for all of those little special children we have, actually, Rod, Rod Sivine and he's singing The Little Rosa. That's a beautiful thing. Now, for all those people in the hospital and those people who are convalescent at home, we have uh, Frank, uh, Frank Patterson is singing The Holy City. And our, our mixed request now we have our Count Tom McCormick is singing Believe Me for All Those Endearing Young Charms. Then we have At the Ballet Like It, the one only Nelson Eddy. And Winston Wars, uh, Arthur Tracy. I, I will be always loving you, always loving you. And that will be actually sung by uh, Dina Durbin. My love is like a red rose, cannot be killer. There's a bridal hanging on the wall, and that's a very, a very old one indeed. And that's sung now by John Kerr. Silver trays among cigars and when you and I were young Maggie. Now I promised a lady no later than last Saturday and that was Mrs. Uh, Cathy, Cathy O'Callaghan down there in St. Isaac's Street St. Mary's Park because she has beautiful silver hair and in between they sing two songs. First he starts off with Maggie and then he comes in silver trays among cigars and that is the uh, two butters. Now I'll be playing and I'll be playing for all the ladies who have lovely, uh, lovely silvery hair. When you hear it. And now for all those Mary, we have, a, we have one or two more we might be able to get them in because uh, for all those uh, beautiful and glamorous Mary with us, we have Love Can Be Dreamed, the one and only, of course, uh, John Charles Thomas. Now, my special guest today, as far as I know, I only know a couple of them, but I know there'll be eight or nine of them in here today. And they're coming down there from like, uh, the Wisest Court Community Centre. Now, I hear that they'll be guided down there by the one and only Father Harry, Harry Began. Heavy on the miracle, Harry, Harry a great young Munster supporter. Also from the chairman there, the one and only Peter Quinn. Now, I want to tell Father Harry, if he's listening to me, and Peter Quinn, if you're coming down in a car, in your cars, and you're bringing some of the ladies down, such as Maggie Cronin, remember, you can park your car, Peter, you can park your car when you come down into Willie Griffin's uh, funeral, when an artist's funeral parlor, yeah, alongside, into, the, into his yard. When you come down, you must come down, William Street, and then you have to turn around to come up, up, up onto what you call General Griffin Street, and when you come to Willie, uh, Willie, um, uh, what's his name, Willie, Willie Lynch, Willie Lynch's funeral parlour there, just pull in there and just print your room inside for your car. You can park your car inside there, Peter. So if you do, if you are thinking of coming down with some of the ladies, don't forget. So if you are looking for a, 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 a parking space, well, you're, you have no worry about that. Drive in to the yard, straight into the yard, and you print your room to turn inside as well. So two or three minutes to walk around to Lady Limney. I hope you got that message now. Now, actually, the areas I picked up for the day are uh, the Ballykeeve Estate, Dora Dyle, Dora Dyle Road, Dora Dyle Estate, Raheen Estate, uh, Meadowville, Patrick's Well, Mungra and Clarina. That's the, the, all that I have today enough because my special guests will be coming in around 2 o'clock and they should be on till about quarter to four today because we have a lot of singers and there's some fine singers up there as well. And we know Frances Duggan herself because Frances sings about with the Redemptive Choir and she's one beautiful voice. As far as I know, she, she took part in a talent, a talent competition up in Dublin there about two years ago. Well, we'll wait till we get him in later on and then we'll, wait, we'll come to that bridge and then we'll cross it. So, just to let you know, I won't be calling out the handicapped children's names today because Actually, I have an awful lot on, on, on my plate here today. So what I'll do, I'll just mention all the little handicapped children all uh, down out there in St. In St. Vincent's Training Centre out there in Les Negroy. All the little handicapped children that is above in Barnmore, the Brothers of Charity above, in Liz, above there in Barnmore. And not forgetting, of course, St. Gabriel's, St. Gabriel's there in St. Joseph Street. All the little handicapped children there, the boys and the girls. I must forget now Captain McCauley School down the Long Avenue and uh, each and every one of you. Not forgetting all the little children down there in the children's ward down there in, um, in St. John's Hospital. Right, the late Larry Foxy O'Brien there in his inimitable broadcasting style. As I said, 
the man seemed to have more ideas crammed uh, uh, trying to get out than he actually had words to accommodate it at, at any one time and uh, you know if you had listened to Radio Limni back in those days this wasn't something that he did for a few minutes he could actually keep this up for hours on end and uh, one of the guests in the studio now in fact George Lee who worked on on, uh, uh, on Radio Limni in those days tells me that on one occasion when somebody failed to show for a programme immediately after Larry O'Brien's, Larry actually kept going for six hours, George. That's correct, yeah, Jim. And uh, another memory, as I was telling you there, just as we were, were off the air listening to, listening to him there, was he introduced a record on, at one stage as a gentleman of my acquaintance was driving down O'Connell Street. He didn't actually play the record before the chap arrived at home in Adair. Uh, whether the record was ever played, I think, is probably up for debate. Don Murray, um, you knew John Trolley, you worked on Radio Limney as well, um, but you worked on, shall we say, stations with a, a little bit more money, a great deal more expertise behind them than perhaps we've had here on the Limerick stations. Um, what was it like coming to uh, Radio Limney from well, working I, on Canadian stations? Jim, I remember arriving home and uh, being up at my sister's place and um, they had the radio on there, John was on at the time. And I asked my brother, and my brother-in-law, I said, uh, I said, my God, what's that, you know? He said, that's the, the local radio station. And that was my introduction then to, uh, to John Frawley at the time, you know? This must have been quite a, a, a shock, having come from the way things are done uh, on, on continental shell, America. Shell shock, yeah. Yeah. Shell shock. Um, but did you, in fact, discover that, this, that, that John, in fact, knew his audience, that, that he was giving them what they wanted? I didn't at the time, um, but as I listened, you know, over the weeks, then uh, I began to realize that uh, this is what they were used to, and, uh, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first time I went down to see him about going on there was he said, we can't use you, you know. Uh, we can't use your accent, and uh, you're too professional for this, uh, you know. So I was very uh, disgusted altogether. <laughs> All set to go back that week, you know. Right, um... One of the problems of the program like this is trying to fit everybody in, but somebody that we can't let go um, is on the telephone line at the moment, um, Joe Quill, uh, who was known in his days on Radio Limney as Joe the Carryman Quill. Um, can you hear me, Joe? Yes, indeed, Jim. Uh, good evening, and you're very welcome to Monday People. Thank you, indeed, Jim. It's a privilege. Uh, now, what are your abiding memories of John Frawley? Well, I know John going back many, many years. I worked down in Cecil Street near the GPO and it's up in pub. It's no longer a pub now. It's a Midland Finance Company. It used to be the Regan. And um, John used to pop in there, like, and um, I often went in with him to St. Michael's. There. He was very good at the snooker, of course, uh, at the time. And uh, later on, then, of course, I became involved with the broadcasting. Uh, he... I just said to him one day that I'd like to do a programme, being very interested in the Irish scene. And he said, certainly, of course, come down. And so he started me off, and it lasted for six years. And uh, certainly was a great six years, most enjoyable. Of course, he gave me the title, Joe the Gentleman, the Kerryman Quill. No, the Kerryman part of it was correct, but the gentleman part might be open to question. <laughs> but it uh, was, was really enjoyable, and it was a great privilege to work on the station. What, what sort of programme were you doing, Joe? I was doing basically the Irish. You know, Foster Madden and Johnny McAvoy, all that stuff. Um, John O'Regan, who also worked on, on, on Radio Limney. Of course, I should, yeah. Um, John, uh, what would your memories be of, of uh, Radio Limney and John the Man Frawley? Well, um, <coughs> first of all, I was trying to get into radio for a number of years, and I always wanted to work with John Frawley ever since the time of RLWE. So I kept up a campaign for about two years to try and get him to listen to me, but it was impossible. But on the advice of Dr. John Maloney, I went up one day and had a chat with John, and I found him a kind of a hard person to sort of convince that I, that I wanted to do it, but I eventually got around him through sheer determination. But I found that once he, once he, liked, once he heard a programme and he liked it, that was it. I mean, he would support it as much as he possibly can, and it gave me a great boost because... It was only my second time, really, on radio was at that time, you know, because I, uh, I was kind of losing self-confidence or whatever. But um, I found him great, very, very supportive. Was, was this your experience too, um, Joe Quiddle, that, that 
Uh, John Frawley was very supportive oh, when, when, when he thought you were doing the right thing. Oh, absolutely, Jim. No, some of the people speaking earlier as well said that they found him um, really in, in private a very shy sort of man, which was not the image that he gave on the air. Um, w would that be your experience too? Uh, yeah, basically he was very private, you know. Uh, I met him occasionally in a few hostelries because he'd jam some tennis, which was his favourite. And uh, he was great guy to those things. But at a function or a thing like that, as somebody did mention there earlier on, we had a number of them in the Glentworth and so forth. He'd kind of, you know, prefer to remain in the background as, as much as possible. Mm. Joe, you might be able to tell me, because I've been trying to find out for ages, how did he hit upon the idea of doing the death notices? Gosh, Jim, I don't really know now, to be honest with you. W were they running before you came on the station? Oh, they were indeed, yeah. Mm. They were. Um... No, you, you, but you don't, in fact, know whether this was something he stumbled on by accident or whether it was by design. I'd imagine it was by design. I, I, I really couldn't say enough when, when the idea first came to him. But, of course, it was a, a great service, really. And as I think Lyndon Ian mentioned earlier on, people used to scoff at it, like, but it, it became a great service. Mm, it, it did, and I'll tell you, it, he, he started something there because... Every local radio station in the country now, with the exception of the two in Dublin, uh, who, who sort of see themselves as a, a, a bit more uh, urbanised, right. uh, are, are doing the, the death notices. And uh, certainly it's one thing I think that no local station could be without. That is very and cool, yeah. in our early days here, in fact, we had several complaints from listeners who said that we weren't doing as many obituaries as John the Man used to do. Mm -hmm. No, quite how we could have managed uh, to, to have done more, I don't know, right. unless we were to go out and actually shoot some of our listeners, right. you know. Uh, yeah. We have a, a, another caller on the line. Stay on, Joe. Uh, we have another caller on the line who worked with John in the early days at RLWE, uh, uh, Mr. Flannery. Can you hear me all right? Hello? Mr. Hello. Hello, Mr. Flannery. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jim? Yes, you're coming through fine. No, uh, one thing, I didn't work in LLWE, but I have the last recording, recordings of LLWE, the very last program they made, the night before the slows down. Now, oh. I was on John Frawley on three different occasions when he was down in Lower, lower uh, Cecil Street, when he first started in Limerick. Oh, indeed, yes. So you, you, you've on, got some historic recordings then there. Yes, I have an odd, and I can tell you, uh, John Farley started on his shooting, and as, as you were just said there, uh, there was one thing about him, you always knew who was dead anyway, that was for sure. Oh, indeed, and yes. fairly well and you know so a lot of the people as you know yourself John knew everyone oh indeed <clears throat> and I think uh, I, uh, that lad in the Murray's who uh, th that was on there some time ago I think it was Murray that was on you had on there before that Mr. Murray mm, Don, Don is here in fact yeah well I think he, he would have known my family as well oh uh, indeed and uh, as I say I, I'm very grateful to you Mr. Wallace for appreciating John Frawley because he didn't get enough appreciation for what he done in this city for for local radio. And well, I think this is very good. I mean, I just see yourself at the moment, the local stations, they're, they're, they're on a shooting, and um, I mean, I don't know where the money is going to come out of. Well, um, we, we'll, we'll, can keep going. We'll, we'll, we'll struggle on anyway. Look, it, it was very good of you to call us in, and thank you very much indeed. Um, right, um, Joe Quill, you're, you're still on the line. Yeah, still here, Jeremy. Yeah. Right, um, you, you, you were listening to that. Some of the tapes of the early days at RLWE. Ha have you got a fair amount of taped material from your days with um, Radio Limney? Oh, gosh, I have. We have a fair amount of them. A uh, lot would be bits and pieces, like, you know. Yeah, because I, I tell you, one thing that certainly struck me was that, uh, that, that there's definitely uh, a, a case for putting together some sort of documentary uh, on the days of... of uh, the, shall we call it the pilot radio uh -huh. here in Limerick and Radio Limney and certainly John Frawley would, would play a major part in that oh, sure, uh, yeah. because as I said at the outset of, of this programme um, he is definitely one of the, the, the pioneers of local broadcasting uh, in, in Limerick City and, and in, the, in this area and uh, as Mr Flannery there said he didn't get uh, if you like the recognition uh, that the work he did deserves 
Uh, and um, perhaps, I suppose, l l as happens to a lot of people in this country, they only get that recognition after they're gone. That's very true indeed, Jim. Um. Now, um, Joe, are there any other particular uh, memories that you might have of uh, uh, John Trolley that you'd want to share with us at this time? Yeah, I do. Uh, one thing what he used to do with the birthday files, you know, well-known personalities from the Sunday Independent, I think it was. But I remember one particular week, it was my birthday, and I think Tom Clifford celebrated his birthday around the same week. And John was reading them out, you know, very distinguished names and all that. And suddenly he says, ah, DJ persists, there's something wrong here. Uh, Joe Quill is missing, says he, and Tom Clifford. <laughs> and uh, he said, I certainly have to do something about it. I have to write off to them or something, you know. <laughs> he, he was absolutely unique. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, he had a, he had a knack, actually, for taking the commonplace and making it sound as though it was something very special, didn't it? Sure thing, oh yeah. Yes. Joe Quinn and Tom Clifford, like, with two very distinguished <laughs> citizens. Tom Clifford, certainly, yes. yes. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention, Jim, of course, as you know, he contested an election one time. That would be roughly about 1981, June 1981. He did, and some of, some of, some of those who should have known better uh, tried to pretend that, that he actually... Uh, Made, made a mistake in right, going yeah, to the yeah. wrong part of the town, which yeah. wasn't true at all, I believe. Yeah, of course not. He was visiting his election agent at the time, the late That's John right, Burnett. Yes. But uh, he got a very creditable 866 first preferences, which I think was quite good. But uh, that apart, one thing I found unique was about two days later in the famous Galloping Maggot, he went around the town with the loudspeaker thanking the people, thanking the electorate. Now, that's something rare for a pol politician to do, and very few of them have done so. So mm, it was unique it in that sense as well. No, you, you reminded me of something there that nobody else has mentioned tonight, and that was the famous Galloping Maggot. Oh, sure, does, yeah. does anybody here know where the, the name came from? Or is it just something that he thought of himself? Don Murray, that you, you come across that? I don't, actually, Jim. I, I, I don't remember uh, where the name... Some of the other lads know that uh, worked with him earlier, I suppose, but uh, where it came from originally, I don't Yeah, you, you don't the, remember where the, the name came from, Joe? Some of the listeners are... Uh, no, uh, Jim. No, I suppose, actually, it was another instance, I suppose, of, of, of John's innate wit. Sure. That he had the knack of putting names on things, like his trick of calling the, the different types of weather by names, uh, which went, might sound childish in one sense, but when he did it, you, you, you sort of, uh, you had to laugh, because it, it, it sounded so right when he was doing it. Yep. Um, Joe, it was very good of you indeed to, to have called, it, called in to us. Um, T tell us, t can you remember some of the other characters who worked on the station in your time there? Um, well, course, there would have been Fonsi Renahan now, for example, well, whom we hadn't course, mentioned yeah. up to now. Yeah, Fonsi. And Fonsi used to do the church notices. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, can you remember what, what Fonsi was like as a broadcaster? Oh, Fonsi was unique in his own way also. Uh, basically, he'd been on religious affairs and... Uh, you know, maybe the different services that might be in the different churches, mm. reading them out. Because once he had a distinction not given to too many of us, that he actually went to see the Pope, didn't he? Well, he did, yeah. 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 That was a rare distinction, okay. And, uh, of course, some of the lads are in there with you tonight. Uh, Don Murray, my good friend Don. Uh, Don Mike Hogan. And... Uh, Fancy, of course, the late Larry Lott, Mercy in him. Yes. And a um, very good friend of mine, the late Walter yes. Bretton, Oak Stanley. And, and Walter, of course, yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it, that you're never going to see characters like those again, are you? Like not Larry John, and Walter. Not, not, never will, will, or, or John himself. Yeah, we will. And, and, you know, people said to us um, when we went on the air, actually, you're not a bit like Radio Limney, but, you know, we, we couldn't be like Radio no, Limney since no way, we, we didn't have a Walter, we didn't have a John, right, we yeah. didn't have a, a, a Foxy O'Brien, yeah. and we didn't have a Tommy Hines, you know, they were gone. And and um, while we remember them with fondness and with affection, we can't really try to imitate them, can we? Very true, very true indeed, Jim. Now, I believe, uh, stay with us, uh, Joe, we have uh, a, a Mr. Pat Carey on the line, who was uh, a particular friend of John Frawley's. Um, Pat Carey, can you hear me all right? I can, of course, Jim. Yeah. Right. And then, Jim, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for doing something on, on, on John, because he was a good character, you know, and he was a, a real kind man behind the scenes, you know. Mm. I'm delighted you did a program for him. Not at all. It, it's a privilege and a pleasure to, to, to be able to do it, to uh, uh, re remember him with fondness for, for, mm -hmm. for all he did. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, John Frawley and the other people that, that we were mentioning, like, like Walter and, and Fonsi and Foxy O'Brien and so on, they, they added a, a certain richness to all our lives, didn't they? Oh, they did, they did indeed. But John, uh, you mentioned that earlier on that tonight, John was a very, very um, shy man behind everything, behind the scenes, you know? And John was a very quiet man. 
and a very kind man to the poor. People didn't know that, you know. Mm. And you mentioned there, you asked there earlier on, why did John ever introduce um, the death notices? Well, one night I asked John that at home, you know. And John mentioned that he decided to put it on because you had a lot of people living alone and couldn't get out to buy a paper. And you had blind people listening to him. These people couldn't read. And he decided to go and put that on and let the people know, which I thought was quite good. Indeed. I mean, this is one of the things that we... Uh that, that, that in fact we've been remarking on about John uh, that in fact he, he seemed to have this kind of rapport with the people who were listening in right. to know what it was that they w that they really wanted from, from a local station to keep keeping them in touch with themselves and with their neighbours that's right, that's right Yeah. Um, how did you get to know John yourself? you, you were a, a particular fr a personal friend of his were you? I was, well, I got to know, know John through um, the Red Cross days in Cruz's Hotel you know, I knew him before that, but I, I got to know him quite well then, when we started running the weekly dances there. We introduced the Monarchs. And it was then I started to get to know John. And we used to meet quite a lot. And then as we, you know, as time went on, we started to meet. And practically every weekend I'd meet John at home. We'd go to his house and John would come over here. And, and I believe that you were also a, a friend of uh, the late Tom Tobin, uh, um, Tom, who yeah. did a fair amount of broadcasting on Radio Limney as well. He did indeed, actually. And it was Tom, actually, that, that recorded uh, the Mass for John, you know, when, at John's funeral. Yes. Uh, Tom recorded all of that, and I have that here on tape. Yes. It was a friend of mine, Tony Punch, who recorded it for him. Yes. You know, it, 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 that, um, that's a sad one, you know. It, it is indeed. It is indeed. It's a, it's a shame, you know, in so many ways that, that so many of those who were associated um, with the station, the people you could say were the real characters of the station, are sadly no longer with us. That's right. You had the, you know, but poor Tom was a nice guy, but you still have some characters left there. You have still, you know, I was very fond of you have Don Murray, which I had them there earlier on tonight. I, 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 Don was a good character in himself. You have um, Alf, and you still have Mike Hogan there. Well, Mike I, now is, is sitting beside me I again, having that. stepped out for a few minutes. <laughs> um, Mike, you, you knew Pat Carey yourself, of course. You know Pat yeah, Carey. Yeah, but I didn't know we were on television, actually, because you said you could see me beside him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, of course, Pat, you, you were a gentleman who used to, the early hours of the morning, bring me up and uh, tell me that cuckoos have been heard in various parts of Ireland because of your travels. Uh, there was another occasion, I think, that... Uh, it was something to do with um, some kind of a, an unusual bird you rang me up one day, didn't you? <laughs> told me to look out the window, and we didn't have a window. <laughs> that's that's on the Cecil Street, actually. That's right. <laughs> the only window we had there was, um, you know what it was used for. I do. You do, but we can't. It's a family radio station. Uh, I was on air one day there, and uh, uh, Seagull mm. actually came in, and there's still a few witnesses left living that saw this particular thing, and it's hard enough to do a live program, I can tell you, but if you have a seagull with the wingspan, I suppose, maybe three or four feet, and it's flapping around, and as you know, the equipment was ultrasonic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, the heating in the particular place on Cecil Street, I still have the marks to prove it, <laughs> on my left uh, leg. Uh, most people think it's some kind of um, something I picked up, but uh, as you know, there was only one bar electric lamp underneath the console, that's right. And that was kept on, I think, summer, winter, spring, and autumn. Yeah. But in remembering that particular uh, the place, there was another thing happening there as well, with the breathing of the budges. You remember the gentleman downstairs <laughs> who, in breathing the budges, began to look like one, actually, himself. That's I thought it was the most unusual thing himself. That's true. Uh, he had a little goatee beard, <laughs> and he wore a type of tammy shanter. That's right. And I remember one night, in the middle of the night, uh, going down, and he came out the door, and I thought it was the, I won't say the end of the world, but uh, I thought it was the fellow was after coming in after midnight, you know? <laughs> Quite true. And uh, you had to, some very good nights there with Joe today. Excellent. Excellent nights Excellent with Joe today. Nights. And uh, that's a gentleman who, in my point of view, as regards uh, local, uh, what I would have put it, uh, archives. Of, uh, of uh, records, he has records going back to oh, the, the old 78, of course, but uh, they're in good condition. Actually, he doesn't leave anyone into his particular room where he has the records. That's right. 
Well, Pat, it was very good of you to, to call us, but um, as always happens on these occasions, uh, all good things must come to an end, and I'm afraid that um, this programme has got to, to come to an end now. Um, it, it, thank you for calling and sharing your memories with us. Thank you. Um, it, 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 it was very good of you indeed to do it. And if I don't know if Joe Quill is still on the line or whether he's, he's gone off. Uh, Joe, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed for calling in as well. Delighted. Uh, and it, it was lovely talking to you. And I, I hope indeed that we'll be able to, to, to talk again on a later occasion because I think um, certainly a, a more organised documentary perhaps mightn't be out of the question uh, at a later date. And, I, you know, really, I suppose, uh, there's such a long list of people to thank uh, for coming in on this programme tonight that I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, just to, to say to you that you should remember in, in, in your prayers um, those uh, of the, the, the broadcasters on Radio Limney who've sadly passed on. Uh, people like Foxy O'Brien, Walter Stanley, uh, Tommy Hines and of course John himself. And we leave John with the final word on Monday, people, tonight. Uh, and for me, Jim Wallace, I'll just say thank you all for having me at your place. and that brings to an end tonight our tribute to John Frawley on this the week of the uh, anniversary of his death it's a uh, quarter past